Welcome to Screen Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in the hospital, sitting across from a psychiatrist who was telling me I had bipolar. I was sent home with a bunch of medication and laid on the couch for a week. I had my iTunes library on shuffle, trying to shake the hornet's nest from my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using loud music as a form of therapy. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This podcast looks at that connection through the lens of different guests. This is Screen Therapy. I know a lot of punks who end up in social work and the mental health sector. With the support groups and health coaching that I do, I've thought about going that route as well. Jonah Bayer plays guitar in United Nations, a hardcore supergroup of sorts, featuring Jeff Rickley from Thursday and some other miscreants who like wearing Ronald Reagan masks. Seriously. Playing in United Nations and his previous band, The Love Kill, Jonah has come across many punk musicians with mental health issues. With this in mind, Jonah decided to pursue a career in mental health counseling. In 2019, he enrolled in the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program at Antioch University in New England. With a handful of classes left before he starts his internship, Jonah's coming up to the finish line for his master's degree. Jonah's long-term goal is to provide counseling for bands. With his experience in the punk scene, he can relate to band dynamics, the pressures of touring, and what he calls arrested development what to do for a career outside the band. Scream Therapy has featured several punks working in the mental health field. When Jonah enters the professional counseling world, I'm sure he'll share his punk ethos with his clients. They'll be lucky to have him. Hi, my name is Jonah Bayer, and I play guitar in the band uh, United Nations. We've been together since about uh, 2007. Prior to that, I played guitar in a band called The Love Kill. Prior to that, I was a music editor at Alternative Press Magazine. I've toured a lot, toured on the Warp Tour for AP, toured in my own bands, obviously, and recorded. Now I'm currently a graduate student in Antioch University's Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. You talked to me about your ultimate goal is to work with musicians and artists once you're done and licensed. Can you tell me about that? The counseling came about kind of organically. I also hosted a podcast called Going Off Track for six or seven years. The podcast is still going. Kind of in the course of doing all these long form interviews, I feel like these concepts of mental health, of depression, of anxiety, all these issues, trauma, you know, would come up through these conversations. I was not necessarily, you know, seeking that out, but I found it to be really fascinating. I started kind of reading up on this stuff myself and it had such a large prevalence just organically in these conversations. And it just seemed like there weren't really maybe a lot of resources geared specifically to people in bands. You know, punk is sort of my background. Something else related to the podcast was, you know, we had Scott Hutchison from Frightened Rabbit on and he's someone, you know, who struggled with mental health, who we lost. He was not someone who was a close friend of mine, but we stayed in touch when he passed away a few years ago. It kind of pushed me a little bit more to be like, okay, this is so sad. This seems like maybe some of these things could be preventable if people had the right resources. So I felt like maybe I can do this. So I sort of pivoted into that. And my goal is to um, work with artists, musicians, those types of people on these issues once I'm licensed as a mental health therapist, because I feel like I've sort of been on sort of both sides. Now I have all this kind of therapeutic knowledge I'm working on. From your experience being on the road and being with all these different folks, you mentioned Scott from Frightened Rabbit who took his life. Do you see people that you know in in the music scene dealing with these things differently than maybe outside society? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, you know, because I still am a journalist and I feel like so many press releases I get now are, this album's about this musician's mental health. This is about this musician's struggle with mental health. And I feel like it wasn't like this even maybe five years ago. 
So I think in the punk scene, it's accepted. I think it's less stigmatized, maybe. I mean, I think it's less stigmatized in general, but I think things become kind of less stigmatized in the punk scene first a lot of times. I feel like it's such a specific lifestyle, right? Like traveling in this way, doing all of these things yourself. I feel like so many people in the punk scene, in the DIY scene, have burnout, all of these things that maybe aren't addressed. I feel like there's so much kind of self-reliance, and I think that can be a good thing, but I think also it can be hard maybe to know when you need to reach out for help. What drew you to punk rock in the first place? I was into like Guns N' Roses and like metal as a teenager. And then I think my first punk show was I saw Down By Law, Good Riddance and Melancholy. I don't know, when I was like 15, I stage dive. I was like, oh, this is so cool. And I got like super into Epitaph and the Fat Rex stuff. All the Victory Records stuff was so big, mid to late nineties. I feel like I came up in like this really like golden age of punk. One of my other first shows was Rancid on the Alk on the Wolves tour. So I was seeing all of these shows where these records are sort of like legendary now. And I was just so drawn to it. And it was, I had like two friends in high school who were into punk. It felt like such a small group. And so like you would meet other kids into it. There wasn't social networking. So it was a lot of digging for records. I worked at a record store. So I was just really involved in that world. And then when I went to college, I started working on this zine law of inertia that I did for a couple of years. And that became my really big passion was reviewing records and just listening obsessively to music. So those early shows were really kind of influential. I mean, I saw Green Day and the Dookie tour. I mean, all this stuff, it was just what was happening at the time. And now you look back, I guess it's like classic rock or something. Sounds like we were at some of the same shows, but on different sides of the country here. So how did you connect with Jeff Rickley and the United Nations guys? I know he formed the band and it's been pretty mysterious about who was in it, but how did that all come together? I met Jeff on Warp Tour when I was working for AP in 2002. The New York Times dubbed it the Summer of Screamo. That was the year that we used Thursday, Thrice, all of these bands had this sort of mainstream crossover. And so we were both in our early 20s, I guess. I became friends with Jeff just basically through seeing him every day for two months. We were into like a lot of the same kind of music and stuff. And then I was playing in this band. I was living in Cleveland. I was playing this band, The Love Kill. And somehow Jeff, I gave a CD to Jeff. I don't remember, but Jeff ended up liking the band and he signed us to his label at the time. So we signed to Jeff's label and we toured a lot. When the band broke up, I ended up moving to New York. This was like 2007 or so. And Jeff had been starting United Nations and was like, oh, you live in New York now, we should, you know, kind of brought me into the fold and we started writing music together basically. And so that's how it happened. I think pretty shortly after I moved there. So tell me about the transition for you between being heavy into the punk scene, being in bands, touring, writing and recording albums to going towards more of a mental health interest. You know, I think a lot of it had to do with getting older And United Nations has not been a super active band for at least a few years. Like we haven't played a show since Gainesville Fest three or four years ago. I'm not exactly sure. So I think I was sort of not touring as much. I was home more. I ended up, you know, moving out of New York to Western Massachusetts to be with uh, my now wife. And so I I was out here and I was sort of trying to figure out my next move. To me, it just sort of made sense. I really wanted to do something outside of writing about music, both because, you know, I had felt like I'd done it for so long and also because it was just become super hard for me to make a living doing that. I was getting closer to 40. And so I don't know, I was just thinking about what I was interested in. And I was, you know, looking at like what I was reading was into and I having these conversations all the time. And I found them to be just really interesting. And I can do this if I had the proper training. Another aspect of it was that I was looking for a therapist once I moved and it was hard for me to find one because so many of them were so booked up. And I was like, oh, wow, there really is a shortage of this. Maybe I could just do it. This is what I would want and it's not here right now. So maybe I could just take five years and do it myself. That's the punk way of doing things. Yeah, I guess, I guess. I mean, like, you know, I hadn't been in college for 17 years. Yeah, I guess I never really thought of that as being like a punk thing. I just wanted to do it. I feel like I was at a place in my life where I had kind of the time and the resources to enter like a master's program. So yeah, I just applied to a bunch and I was lucky enough to get into Antioch and it's been like a really great experience so far. Punks often will have to join the real world and get a career and do all those things that we all do. But I think a lot of times punks have a hard time aligning their ethics and ethos that comes with the punk scene with 
their careers. And there's a disconnect for a lot of people. When you transitioned into going to school for mental health and for counseling, did it clash with any of your values? No, it didn't. And I feel like that might not be true of a lot of occupations or programs, but I feel like, especially the program I'm in, there's such a social justice focus in it. I mean, it's really aligned with progressive politics. I didn't really feel that way. I felt like it's pretty closely aligned with punk, but I definitely felt what you might feel, the adjustment of having homework. You know, it's very structured. It felt really actually aligned with punk in a lot of ways. It felt pretty, maybe not radical, but it felt super progressive. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of the people that I know in the punk scene are doing jobs in social work and the health sector. There must be something there. You don't see a lot of punks in advertising. There's a connection there, I think. Yeah, I think so too. I, as evidenced by your podcast, like I found out about your podcast through a newsletter I got from Justin Pearson, who had been on my old podcast. I think the fact that this podcast exists, being able to book guests proves that there's definitely some sort of crossover there. You talked to me about uh, this concept of arrested development and how artists, especially musicians who are touring punk bands that are trying to make a go of it for even a couple decades sometimes, get caught in this place between that life and potentially their next stage of their careers. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true on so many levels. You know, I just think to a lot of friends that I have, people in the industry or people in bands who, in order to be in a band, you really have to dedicate yourself 100% to it. You can't just tour part-time, you know, when you're in your 20s. So I feel like I have so many friends who didn't go to college or dropped out of college to do the band, flash forward 20 years, and it can be difficult to obviously have a band that you can sustain it. And, you know, so I think there's a lot of time when you're on the road where you don't have to really have these kind of responsibilities. I remember I did an interview for AP, a cover story on Fall Out Boy. And I remember Pete Wentz saying, you know, I moved into a new house. I didn't know how to set up the cable. You just have people that do things for you. Obviously that's like a super huge successful band, but even on, on a lower level, you sort of, you'd show up to a venue. It's like, here's what you're eating. Here's your drink tickets. You're staying at someone's house or you're going to get a cheap motel. I mean, there's so many of these life things that you don't need to worry about. And I think that can be exciting, especially when you're younger. But I do think that as you get older, it can be difficult to adjust, you know, ease back into that world. And some people are able to do it super well, but I think for some people it can be really hard to transition from being on the road and being just responsible for the band to having a career or other things. And I also think that communication, I think is can be such an issue within bands. I think there's a lot of interpersonal communication that I've seen in so many bands that people maybe not having the emotional maturity or the emotional kind of skills to communicate with each other. And I think if I would like to also sort of work with groups and maybe help, help facilitate those kind of conversations, because I think it would benefit so many bands. It's like, you know, we see so many bands that sort of break up. I think a lot of that can really be due to people not getting along. And I think a lot of that comes down to communication. I just think there's so much going on there. I think it can be a hard thing to understand if you've never been a part of that world. And I think about it as being a place of resilience, being in a punk band and the lifestyle that comes with that. And there's a lot of potential there for things to go off the rails. That particular lifestyle or scenario, it can have a lot of charge to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It can be like comedy or any of these things. I mean, I think there can be a lot of catharsis through it and a lot of positivity. And I also think it can have this darker side of being in these clubs every night drinking. It can be tough, especially when you have expectations and maybe they don't, they don't work out the way you want them to. And you've put so much of yourself into this. I've never been in like a full-time touring band that was playing like 200 shows a year, but I can imagine how taxing something like that would be. But there is that time of being on stage for the hour. In my mind, that's the place where all those negative things come out in a positive way. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And I do think there is something about that experience and the energy. I don't listen to like as much super heavy music anymore, but I, I really like performing it because I do feel like there is something about just, you know, a packed room and letting all of that out and feeding off. It is really cathartic and it is 
for us is like an hour would be generous, whatever that period of time is. I think there is something to that. And I don't know exactly how to quantify it, but it is, is something. And obviously like you're saying it, like I've, I've heard it a lot. I did an interview with Trevor from Pelican and he was like, there's no reason why we should be doing this, but we just feel like we have to do it. There's some people just have this, like, you have to do it. And so, yeah, I think that that's can be something really, really positive as well. Have you dug deep and tried to figure out why that is, why you have to do it? I've done, you know, I've done research about the neurology around it. There's a really great book called This Is Your Brain on Music. I did a report on that and I've read a lot. I think a lot of it, us talking about these 90s punk shows, I mean, that is a, a super important developmental time as a human. So you're forming the synaptic connections. These teenage years, I think, are so important to your development. That's when a lot of people get into punk, right? There is something to being kind of immersed in this scene at this super important developmental era and how it kind of manifests itself through your behavior as an adult. Because there aren't like a lot of things that you get into when you're a teenager that you necessarily carry with you your whole life. And, you know, obviously not all people that get into punk as teenagers carry with them the whole life, but it seems like a lot of people do. They might not be in a band, but they still are going to pick up the new Thrice record or something, even if they're not going to show. So I think there is something developmental about it. But I don't know how to quantify it, I guess, as far as the live cathartic experience. I don't know exactly what that is. I mean, maybe it's some kind of thing in our DNA. So you've done a lot of music journalism over the years, talked to a lot of bands. You mentioned some names before. I'm sure you've talked to everything from upstart bands to bands that have been millionaires or whatever. I'm wondering if the subject of mental health comes up a lot or whether you get a sense of folks that are in the punk scene grappling with those issues and feeling comfortable to talk about them? It's something that's come up a lot. I think it comes up a lot now. I mean, I think it's it's been way less stigmatized. I think it's something that can just be really relatable to hear about. It comes up a lot. I just think it's changed. I mean, like I said, I think so many records today are about mental health or about struggles with that. And so um, people are putting it out there to talk about it and kind of raise awareness about it. I think it's really fascinating. And I think, um, you know, some of the guests you've had on the podcast from the punk world who have transitioned into therapy, that's something that I'm just super interested in hearing their perspectives and learning about their journeys. To me, it's related in some way, right? I feel like if I went back to like learn like accounting or something, I would be, it doesn't feel that different from what I was doing before. I mean, it just seems so much of counseling is interviewing which is obviously the journalism that, you know, that's interviewing. So you're doing a therapeutic interview. So there's, you know, a different technique to it. And it just takes a lot of practice and a lot of kind of psychoeducation. What are some of the themes that have come up when you talk to punk bands about these issues? I think there can just be a lot of imposter syndrome. I know for me, like, I feel like I don't know how to play guitar half the time, but I'm like, I've been doing this for so long. I've helped write all these songs. It can be hard to feel confident or something, or especially in the punk scene, like I feel like so many people could hear United Nations and be like, okay, like this is a guy screaming, like I don't understand this, this sounds like noise. Yeah, I would say imposter syndrome, a lot of anxiety. I think there can be, you know, depending on on your band, I think there can be a lot of pressure if you have success to replicate that success. I think there's all of the strain that touring can put on your interpersonal relationships, the strain it can put on on your bandmates. I think, you know, collaborating with bandmates, I mean, I think that that can be a huge thing. People not feeling heard when you're creating something. Certain people may be getting publishing if you're in a bigger band. I mean, there's some, the, the whole business side, I think, can be super hard to navigate. I've never been in a band where really that's brought in enough money for that really be an issue, but I think it can be obviously for a lot of bands. I think depression, obviously. If you were counseling bands or different musicians, what would be your approach? I think my approach would be just to kind of get everyone to sort of listen to each other. Active listening can be so important. I think when you're in a band, people feel like they have to advocate for themselves so much to get, you know, get their ideas out just listening to maybe other people's points of view about maybe the situations or what's going on. Communication is just so, so important. It's something that takes work to really do effectively. And I think a lot of the bands that are successful, 
have this ability to sort of communicate and have been together so long where um, they're able to kind of navigate that. And I think some people can need some help. And so I would, yeah, I would just want to help everyone kind of hear each other, understand where they're coming from. Just the idea of like feeling heard can be so important in a group dynamic when you don't feel heard and it can cause so much tension. I think just feeling heard, even if maybe like it isn't changing the outcome can really help just the overall kind of well-being of, of the group. And I think pushing stuff off to the side and, you know, ignoring problems can just kind of exasperate them, right? Just communicating would kind of probably be my a group therapist, just kind of helping facilitate that, sitting back and letting it happen and then kind of interjecting to keep things on course. From your experience, how have you dealt with that over the years personally? When I was younger, I didn't really know how to, as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at those kind of skills, those interpersonal skills and, and communication. I don't know. That's a really good question. I think when I was younger, I, I, I struggled with maybe some of those ideas. And I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at, at advocating for myself and communicating. And, you know, I think a big part of it is aligning yourself with people who you can get along with also. I've been lucky to have that as well. It's a learning process. I feel like if I were to start a new band today, I would be very clear about my expectations. I'd be very clear about the people involved. I don't think I would leave a lot of ambiguity when it came to that kind of stuff. But I also think I'm in such a different life stage where, um, you know, I'm not going to start a screamo band with a bunch of guys in their forties and expect to start and tour six months out of the year. I think a lot of it comes with age and life experience but I also think that there are techniques that they can be learned. So I think I'm working at it like everyone else, but I feel like I have come a long way from when I first started playing in bands where if an idea of mine didn't get accepted or didn't turn out the way I wanted, then I would be super invested in it and I would have these expectations and be super upset. Now I'm just happy to play music or just happy to kind of catch up with everyone. And it's much less pressure, like clear expectations on what it is, I guess, at this point in my life. Some people say punk rock is a youth culture. What do you think? Yes, I agree. I think it depends. Does that mean that we have to, (laughs) we're we're (laughs) in our 40s, we're done or what? I think it's like youth culture is going to be like, most people are going to get into punk through their youth the way we did. Most of the bands that are going to be really, like to me, the band that was always blowing my mind when I was growing up was like at the drive-in. I mean, to me, that band is so of a time, of an era, of an age. And you know, there was so much talk, like, will there be another at the drive-in? No, there won't be, right? But there will probably be another band that's like super dynamic live shows that makes this really interesting art that is an amalgam of all these bands, like Fugazi, whatever. And so I think it is youth culture in the way that the youth is going to dictate what we hear and how things change. But I also think that as you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, I think you can still be into punk and take those ideas into the world and do something like a podcast or counseling or, or whatever it is that you do and kind of bring those ideas and experiences with you. But I don't think many people in their 40s are just starting to get into punk. I think most people who are into it got into it at that age. And I think a lot of it leads back to neurology, the way our brains develop. I think if you've been, been in it this long, like you're probably stuck with it in a way, right? Maybe I'm being a face. Maybe it's about keeping your inner youth Yeah, I think it is about keeping the inner youth. And I think a lot of it is about fighting against being jaded or or cynical or feeling like you've heard it all before or that it was so much better when you were growing up, which I think is super easy to slide into. It's a practice like anything else. There's records that I still have come out, you know, like I I really like that last Touche Moore record. I really like the new Tiger's Jar record. I mean, there's still records that come out that I listen to over and over. And I'm like, this is... Those are two very different records, but kind of in the same universe. It's not going to be the same as it was when you were a kid, but it is that way for some kid now, and it was their turn. You mentioned before about playing in music and having the catharsis when you're playing. 
Do you remember the first time that you had that feeling? I'm trying to think. I mean, I feel like I had that feeling a lot as an audience member, just going to shows. Growing up, I would be, you know, so excited to go to a show. Like I couldn't sleep the night before. And so like just going to those shows, whether it was like crowd surfing or, or any of that kind of stuff, like I feel like I, I had that feeling as a spectator. And then I feel like once I started playing music, didn't have the language around it. I mean, like I quit my job at AP basically to tour with this band. I was in the Love Co. We did a five week tour in Europe. Obviously, this was like super important to me because like I quit my job to do it. There's something about it that makes you want to do it. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Scream Therapy. I'm coming to you from Powell River, a small coastal town in British Columbia, Canada, on the traditional territory of the Klohama Nation. Doing this podcast and talking to other folks living with mental health challenges has been a huge part of my journey. It means the world to me that you're out there listening. You can sign up for my newsletter and find more episodes at ScreamTherapyHQ.com. That's ScreamTherapyHQ.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Let's talk punk and mental health. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, take care and be well. You